Hello and welcome back to the From My Perspective podcast where I, Jax McCarty, tell you about the names you need to know in college football and the NFL that could be changing the football landscape in the very near future. So last episode, we got to talk about how I perceive the rankings to be for the NFL head coaches that were hired this past offseason. So I figured we'd stick with that similar format. As I mentioned, players aren't the only ones that get to change football Coaches do it just as much as anybody else. So kind of there's been too much volatility and switchover as there is most years in college football. So I'm only going to give you my top five and then a couple of notable omissions. But yeah, it's pretty, pretty cut forward and simple. So let's go ahead and start off at number five. Rhett Lashley getting his chance to go from Miami as an offensive coordinator to become the head coach at Southern Methodist University. There's a few things to like with this hire. For one, the program familiarity being at SMU in 2018 and 2019, that at least he understands. He's worked under Sonny Dykes, who opened up that position there, and he's also been very successful at Auburn and Miami under Gus Malzahn and Manny Diaz. So there's plenty of promise there. He's he's clearly shown that his style of offense works at multiple different levels and has held relatively strong results at each of those stops. When SMU hired Lashley, I think the natural assumption is that SMU's offense is going to get slightly less than because last year they were a top 15 in most statistics, I believe, uh, as an offense. But it's not like Rhett Lashley was a slouch by any means. They had the 23rd ranking in points per game last year, 19th in yards per game with Lashley at OC at the University of Miami. And a lot of that can be contributed to Tyler Van Dyke's Uh, ascension into being a very high-level football player in in college football, but you don't really get that without a quality system around him. Very few players can play like that regardless of their scheme. So when when you're questioning what identity he's going to bring in, because I would imagine his fingerprints are going to be all over the SMU offense this upcoming year at the bare minimum, he's prioritized running a power spread and really focuses on balance, which should help the jump between SMU from Miami because last year SMU ran the ball 31 times a game and they passed it 38.8% times or 38.8 times a game. So just about 39, they focused on balance as well. You're going to have to find some new pieces to work inside that offense, notably Danny Gray left, which will, will be a detriment very clearly. But I think that Rhett Lashley being as young as he is at 38 years old, he'll have a couple years to get his feet underneath him. By the time he's fully comfortable, the AAC will look a lot different with uh, UCF and Cincinnati both leaving soon. So, you know, he has a chance just as much as Memphis does and some of those other programs to become kind of the face of the AAC and be next up to be pulled away to one of those bigger conferences, which is, I think, a very good opportunity for Rhett Lashley. Who knows if he's there long enough to see that jump? But I, I can see this as a very good starting spot for him, similar to what Luke Fickle did in Cincinnati, where you get comfortable, you learn the ropes, you start building a really good program, and maybe somebody comes knocking down the road that is just too good to turn down. So Rhett Lashley comes in at number five on my list, a former offensive coordinator for the team he's going to. Now we move to somebody who never even had to leave the city that he was in. He just went from inside, moved right up. That would be Marcus Freeman moving from the defensive coordinator spot to becoming the head coach of Notre Dame. One of the reasons I really enjoyed this hiring, and perhaps this is too new age of me, maybe I'm being too young in in some senses, but to look at the social media reaction from the players on Marcus Freeman's hiring and how excited they were that he stayed, plus the lack of real turnover that we have seen in a lot of these programs that have lost their head coach, especially the big ones. That is such a strong thumbs up for Marcus Freeman moving forward. He's already got the locker room. Like, I don't think that that's even in question. He He's a very high energy guy who is going to be able to retain a lot of the personalities in there just because they like him. They play for Marcus Freeman. He's a good recruit. And we've already got to see him 
test drive his new vehicle, so to speak. He he was the head coach for the Fiesta Bowl this year. It was a loss, but when you add everything together, it was a two-point loss, 37-35, to 35, to a really good Oklahoma State team that was making a push for the playoffs at the very end of the year. I think you could have argued that they could have been in. And, it, yeah, it was, it was in the brightest lights that they had had all season. He stepped in. They only lost by two. It, it was really, really impressive from my perspective that or prospective, if we want to stay on brand here, but it, it there's a lot to like already from the jump with Marcus Freeman, and I don't see a lot of volatility. I think they probably drop another game or two next year just so that he can learn what being the head coach of this program is all about. But down the road, I don't see anything stopping him from being in a very similar position and. Maybe he's the one that sticks. When O'Brien Kelly stayed there for quite a while before he decided he wanted to go to the SEC, maybe you get a guy who is super young that can be there forever and ever and ever in Marcus Freeman, which really seems like it could be the case. So we get a guy who is, all all told, relatively inexperienced in roles like this. He was at Cincinnati for a handful of years, was at Notre Dame for a couple, I believe. Then... We move on for number three in our list to a guy who has basically been a head coach. This is his first job, but he's basically been a very important member of the staff for two very well-performing programs, Oklahoma and Clemson. We're talking about Brent Venables, who is taking that job at Oklahoma, finally getting to be the one true head coach as opposed to the assistant head coach that he has been at Oklahoma and Clemson in the past. One thing that really excites me about this hire is that it took so long for Venables to finally get lured away because he knew he did not want to go to a program. He didn't want to just be a head coach to be a head coach. He wanted to go to a program that he believed in, that he knew he could get players to, somewhere he felt some comfortability at, and he got it, Oklahoma. He's going right back to where he started as a former associate head coach, and it's really going to be fun watching what Oklahoma becomes underneath him. They, as a program, have lacked a defensive identity for a very long time, realistically since Lincoln Riley has stepped to the plate. And Lincoln Riley did a really good job of retaining what Stoops built. But I think Brent Venables can realistically create something more of his own than Lincoln Riley did in those handful of years. And A lot of the issue there for me with Lincoln Riley comes from he really wasn't asked to do a whole lot. Brent Venables will have to rebuild a program, a very high prestige program, one that I don't expect will take all that long to rebuild, but he still has to rebuild it all the same. He he's learned underneath some guys who have done some tremendous things for programs, Dabo Sweeney making Clemson what they are, Bob Stoops, a guy that I've been praising just a few seconds ago, and it's not like he's some guy that's coming in that was riding the coattails of Sweeney and Stoops. He he got to pilot the second best defense in the country last year, according to the rankings. And it's there's a lot that you can see with this hire that OU is finally returning to their roots. And I think this is more a hiring focused on getting ready for that SEC jump that happens in 2025. And when you come into the SEC, do you want to be more Mississippi State? where they really prioritize that offense under Mike Leach, and I don't think they worry about the defense as much. You can get better defenses in at Mississippi State than what Mike Leach has had, so I think that helps them a little bit. But you have to beat them with your offense because this defense is going to be tremendous, and even if the offense is somewhere average, your best bet is you're still going to have to get in the end zone at some point. So either your defense is going to have to be really good or your offense is going to have to be better than what Brent Venables can put on the field, which is not something that very many teams at all have ever been able to say. So he also surrounded himself with a really good staff. Ted Roof is going to be his DC. He was formerly of Vanderbilt and Penn State. And he brought in Jeff Levy, who was the offensive coordinator for UCF and Old Miss. So he got guys in there that know what they're doing. And as this program becomes an SEC team in the very near future, you have to like the ideology he brought in with him. And I'm very curious to see what 
the second or third year under Brett Venables looks like. Not necessarily the first year, because like I said, I do think that they slump a little bit. They lost a lot of players, but should be interesting. So he's going back to his roots. Now we've got a guy switching from one rival team to the other, and that being Sonny Dykes, moving from SMU, now being the TCU Horn Frogs head coach. And it is incredibly hard, I can imagine, for TCU fans to not only watch Gary Patterson have to leave, but also bringing in a rival head coach. But man, Sonny is a very, very good head coach. And when you look at his total record, it doesn't look like he's as great as he is, but that's because Cal, his stint at Cal, really weighted his his record down. I believe that's the only stop that he ever had that was below 500. And at, even at that time in Cal, he put a team in the AP poll at some time in the year. He had one at Louisiana Tech, one at Cal, and then three, all of his past three years at SMU. It There's a lot to really, really enjoy about Sonny Dykes, and one of the things that you should immediately be able to tell the boost from is their offense. SMU last year was 14th in yards per game in the country. TCU was 60th. And him being able to bring in the the mindset that created that, that SMU offense over these past few years should really boost TCU moving forward. And we were talking about Brett Vettables making the jump from um, or uh, soon to be making the jump, rather, to the SEC, TCU is going to be in a very different position at that same time because they'll more or less be one of the bigger teams in the Big 12. Unless Cincinnati or UCF immediately come in and take over that conference, it's easy to see TCU becoming one of the the top teams, especially by that time with Sonny Dykes as their head coach. And... It's not like the Big 12 is a historically hard conference to make the playoffs in. You've had a, you've had a couple Oklahoma teams to make that there. Maybe TCU becomes a top 10 program underneath Sonny Dykes. And I'm a little bit confused about how they proceed forward, especially with the quarterback situation. I trust their running back room, but maybe you see a little bit of, of a lag I, I do still think TCU wins more games this year under Sonny Dykes than they did last year with Gary Patterson. But maybe it's not quite great yet. Maybe you're at that 500 mark, and then you make the jump in a year or two. But as a long-term investment, Sonny Dykes, getting him to TCU, I think is a very smart move. So that is my number two. Number one is a guy, definitely not rivals by any means, but he's leaving a major program over the last half decade or so to come to a program that he grew up knowing to be one of, if not the best program in the country. We're talking about Mario Cristobal, the now former Oregon head coach, going down to the U, Miami University. So it's, he grew up in Florida. He saw the Jimmy Johnson years. I believe he played underneath Jimmy Johnson. He knows what it's like when that program is a powerhouse. He knows the vibe. He knows the demeanor. And a lot, you know, every time Miami hires a new head coach, it's, oh, well, they're going to focus on recruiting South Florida and Dade County and really bringing back those roots. And you failed to see it. Mario Cristobal is the guy who can do that. He knows how to recruit and he recruits very, very well. We saw it with Oregon. He had to follow up a couple bad stints with Mark Helfrick and then Willie Taggart's weird departure that worked out so, so well for Florida State. But he he took a program that was really in limbo. They were losing the Chip Kelly era of dominance that was built, and he built it right back up. That became a very good program underneath Cristobal. So it should be a real fun watch to see how he manages to handle everything down there, especially with expectations being as high as they are. I think Cristobal can meet them. You, you're you going to a, con- a conference that was not a powerhouse last year. The ACC was, it was available for the first time in a while with Clemson not being what they usually are. And Cristobal, if he can get, if he can figure it out quick before Clemson does, which there's no telling if that'll happen, but even if they doesn't, I think he can supply a really, really good program to battle them in the ACC for what has traditionally been just a, okay, we put Alabama and Clemson automatically in the playoffs. Those last two spots are kind of up for grabs. Maybe 
maybe you don't even lock up that, that second seed or that second team at the bare minimum. Maybe, maybe you come in and he figures it out, and now all of a sudden we're looking at a Clemson-Miami rivalry in a sense that does truly become who, who's the top dog who will be representing the ACC moving forward. Another strong aspect of this, at least in his first year, because I don't believe he stays much longer, not Cristobal, but Tyler Van Dyke. I, I think he'll probably be gone after this year, but it should help the transition having that talented of a quarterback to work with immediately. And if he can create that window of immediate success and get a lot of recruits on board, then it's going to be hard to stop him moving down the line because if he can get that first wave of recruits, then they get a little bit better. You get the second wave, third wave, so on. It just becomes a trickle-down effect of we're going to keep bringing in these good guys, and so long as we don't start falling off any, we can build a program that can sustain itself and maybe start progressing towards what we know the U formerly to be. So that would be the top five of my list. And of course, there are a couple names here that I know a lot of people have spent a lot of time talking about this year. So let's go ahead and talk about the two that I, I believe are probably the most noteworthy signings of the entire offseason. I just don't know that I love the fit. First, we go with Lincoln Riley from USC, or now of USC, formerly of Oklahoma. They're not a program that we've seen do very well here recently. And I, I don't know that throwing all this money at Lincoln Riley whenever we didn't really see him have to do a whole lot with Oklahoma as far as he was given that blueprint, I just I don't know that I love it because you're committed for a really long time now if this doesn't work out. And they've had those escape hatches with Clay Helton and previous coaches. But Lincoln Riley... I like him. I think it should be a quick turnaround for USC because they brought in so many Oklahoma players. They already know what they're doing with Lincoln. I just don't know that it's really going to lead to a lot of success. His biggest thing is the the Pac-12 really emptying out, especially with Cristobal leaving. Who do you really have to worry about? You know, you've got Washington. You do at least have a couple of years of Cristobal players at Oregon with Dan Lanning, now their head coach. I'm just not I'm not sold on that move. I think I think people who are have very good reason to be. I'm just I'm going to remain skeptical for the time being. If he does work out, then I mean great. That's what he was hired to do. With that amount of money, playoffs should not only be the goal but be the expectation most years. I'm just not going to buy in just yet. And then the other one is Brian Kelly moving to LSU. I he's a good coach. I think I don't think he's a great coach. I think he's a pretty, pretty good one. I wouldn't put him in the top ten in the country as a head coach. But his he being so vocal about I want to take down Alabama, that's going to come back to haunt you because who's been able to do it? Georgia did it this past year, but do we? That was one of the worst Alabama teams we've seen in a little bit, and they still made the national championship. So making them your your priority one whenever you should really probably be focusing on beating out Florida right now with Billy Napier, their new head coach. I I just, I don't know that I love it. And plus, right, I can already see LSU fans turning on him with this weird Southern accent thing he's been doing. Um, and he's coming into the SEC at a really tough time. Arkansas, A&M, Tennessee, all becoming formidable. You'll have Texas and Oklahoma to worry about soon. LSU is going to be, and it should always be a program, that it will be really easy to get recruits into. I just I don't think that he really has the chops to make them a national championship winner, and especially not with what the current field looks like. We, we've seen him deal with Alabama at Notre Dame, which, of course, their methods of getting players in is much more rigorous. You have to have a really high GPA, and a lot of the appeal for an, an SEC school is that you don't have to have these scholars playing football that just so happen to be phenomenal athletes. You're not having to hunt for unicorns exclusively, but I just, I'm not in. I'm not in. And maybe maybe he figures it out and does become a team that threatens Georgia and Alabama. I'm just, I'm not going to put, I'm not going to put my money on it. 
So those would be the top two coaches that I feel like would probably be more notable. I would probably have Billy Napier closer to the top five list than I would Brian Kelly. That's just a me thing, though. I really liked what I saw from Billy Napier. I just wonder if that jump was a little bit too high. Uh, maybe if he shouldn't have waited out for a different program in the SEC to figure stuff out there, get kind of closer to, you know, nine and nine wins, eight wins, somewhere in there, and then make a jump to a Florida. But that's not always how it works out. So he's going to have a big job. I just don't know that I love how that works out. So that would be my top five list, including notable exclusions. So what do you think of it? Feel free to let me know down below. But that's the end of this episode. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, I'll see you next time.